Hey, to all the real estate professionals out there, I want to let you know the Buyer's Mind is sponsored by Homebridge Financial. Homebridge loan officers are experts in new home financing, and they bring sales ideas and strategies and market intelligence and programs that will help sell homes. To learn more about that, go to builder.homebridge.com. Homebridge Financial, home financing made easy. Welcome to The Buyer's Mind, where we take a closer look deep inside your customer's decision-making mechanism to reverse engineer the perfect sales presentation. Now, please welcome your host, Jeff Shore. Welcome, everyone, once again to The Buyer's Mind, a very special episode of The Buyer's Mind, because as I've been thinking about what's going on in the world around us at the time of this recording, we are in the midst of the coronavirus a pandemic and how we're dealing with that. They were very, very interesting times. And I wanted to get somebody on the buyer's mind who could really give us some really calm perspective, both about life and about sales. And so who do you call in that regard? Will you call Anthony Iannarino, one of the smartest guys that you're ever going to meet, but a really, really good level-headed guy with some very, very wise words. Uh, it was a long conversation, so I'm going to jump right in to our conversation on the psychology of fear with Anthony Iannarino. Well, we're thrilled to have back on the buyer's mind, uh, just one of the great sales thinkers of of our age, uh, the author of countless books. But if, if you've never read The Only Sales Guide You'll Ever Need, it's it's just, uh, just so comprehensive, so great. The Lost Art of uh, Closing, uh, Eat Their Lunch, about uh, what you do to try and get the business, get more than your fair share of the business. It's really, really good stuff. Uh, a prolific blogger, if you're not following him, you should. And just a really, really good guy. I'm pleased to count him as a friend. Uh, welcome back to the buyer's mind, Anthony Iannarino. Anthony, how you doing, sir? I'm thrilled to be here, and I'm thrilled to get to talk to you. I feel like you and I just ought to do this every week. Like, just get on the phone and just record it. I could get behind that. I'd be I'd be perfectly good with that. I think if people had if if we actually recorded the conversations that you and I have where we're just rapping for a while, they're pretty interesting. And by the time I walk away, I'm my brain is spinning. You always get me thinking, I admit. Yeah. Yeah. I I, I so enjoy when we get to do that. And so yeah. that some of yeah. this will probably be the same kind of stream of consciousness, Probably. right? That's fine. That's fine. Just two guys having a chat and we'll let everybody else listen in. Some of you might be listening to this months down the road and you'll have to think back on what exactly co COVID-19 was. Uh, but as we're uh, recording this right now, uh, we are in the midst of it. We're in the height of it. I, I hope we're at the apex at this point. Uh, but uh, we're really having to deal with a lot of fear, a lot of panic, a lot of anxiety that is out there right now. And that's what we're going to talk about. So uh, I, although I think the topic will be evergreen, right? There's always fear. There's always anxiety for of one kind for another. It's just exacerbated uh, as we have that availability bias. And if all you hear about is this stuff, then you think that that's all there is uh, to know. So let's just start with uh, on a personal level anthony how are you dealing with this personally uh both uh, emotionally and just tactically well you know in our in our world a lot of stuff gets moved and and so you get speaking gigs that moved or trainings that get moved and things happen when something like this happens and there's a travel ban and you can't get groups of people greater than 10 together, which that, that eliminates a whole bunch of our work sure. yeah and so th that of course causes people you know, fear and you, you start to recognize that the brain isn't really designed for thinking. Mm -hmm. It's designed to keep you alive. And the brain's constantly nagging you about not doing things that are going to prevent you from staying alive, like eating and having shelter and getting a paycheck. And over the past uh, two weeks, um, one of the, the staples of life is apparently toilet paper because people <laughs> have gone and taken all of the toilet paper off all the shelves. Mm -hmm. And and so it starts to turn into scarcity thinking. Most people, the fear is, how do I keep the status quo? How do I stay alive? How do I keep the type of living that I've had? And when we go into difficult situations, and you know this, this reminds me of a cross between 9-11, where there was an enormous loss of life, and something we might still be facing now, and uh, also a tremendous economic damage. So we're doing both of those at the same time, which causes people to do one of two things. So um, for me, my anxiety happens very quickly, and I get a legal pad, and I write down what my action plan is going to be. And as soon as I do that, I feel better. 
Mm-hmm. I feel better taking action, but some people hunker down and they get paralyzed and the fear just causes them to stop. Mm-hmm. And, and it's not really a good idea to do that, but it's an emotional response. And it's not something that somebody's logically thinking, I'm going to hunker down. It's just the fear that's driving them to do that. So p- people tend to go one of two ways. You either overreact like I do, or you underreact. And you really mm-hmm. need to make sure that you're paying attention and that you try to respond appropriately to what's going on. You know, and some of the appropriate thing, have cash in the house, make sure you have food and things like that. That's important. But we see uh, an overreaction for people because we've had the media feeding us a steady diet of fear now for what, three weeks, three or four weeks for sure. But, you know, it's interesting when I when I look at how people respond, I, I am watching that. And I agree, we're seeing it on both sides. As the captain of one of my hockey teams, I had put it out to the guys that they didn't shut down uh, our hockey season until just yesterday, and it was supposed to start this coming week. And I had asked the guys, how are you feeling about this? And one guy was like, are you all idiots? Why would you even think about playing hockey? And we're all going to die, and you're an idiot. you know." And then somebody else is like, hey, come on. It's a cold. It's a cold. This is much ado about nothing. And I'm finding here that there's really a lot of judgment that's taking place on how people are responding or when they were responding. And I suppose some of that is uh, going to be natural if people are over-responding on each side. But there's probably room for some grace to allow people to to uh, deal with this the way that they will. Yeah. And you know, there, there may be both right too. So there, mm-hmm. there's a, uh, uh, everything in the United States has been politicized. It's been getting um, increasingly politicized over time. So part of it's the political response and there's right. uh, my friends on the right, my conservative friends, it's the flu mm-hmm. You get over it. And yeah. it's not the flu because mm-hmm. 368 people died in Italy two days ago. You know, mm-hmm. so it's, it's really, really tough. That's the second oldest population on earth after Japan mm-hmm. and the average age was 81. So they're, they're mm-hmm. overrun and they can't respond to it appropriately. So right. that's one side, but most of the people that get it 80%, it is like a flu and they're sick right. for a week or two and they do get better. Mm-hmm. But we don't know how that's going to um, manifest in any individual person, but we all have parents or, or people that we care about that may have compromised immune systems or something like that. So we're doing our best to be careful. And I think the decision that the the government has made is we're giving up a quarter economically to make sure Mm -hmm. that we don't give up the, the healthcare system. So they're they're trying to err on the side of let's, let's value human life and and get through this, which seems the appropriate response, but the politicalization of this is really, you know, it's problematic because people need to do, uh, what they need to do to be responsible right. right now to themselves and their family. Yeah. Uh, but on that side of how we're reacting, you said something interesting. And we, you and I, uh, we spoke on Sunday about this and and you were quoting your hero, Mr. Talib, saying that overreacting is the appropriate response when probabilities are unknown. Right? Did I, I don't know if I got that quote exactly right, but that's close enough. And, mm-hmm. and Taleb's work in Fooled by Randomness and Black Swan mm-hmm. and Anti-Fragile and Beta Procrustius and Skin in the Game uh, basically leads to a conclusion that you're better off overreacting a thousand times and being wrong than mm-hmm. underreacting and, and being wrong one time. Mm-hmm. And if you've, if you've not been in, uh, to, uh, fooled by randomness, the, the metaphor that T- Taleb uses, and it was real for him because he had a friend who actually played Russian roulette and died. But in, in his words, you know, you, you have a, a gun that doesn't have six barrels with one bullet. Maybe it has a thousand barrels with only one bullet. Well, mm-hmm. if you're wrong on that one particular time, that's the end. Mm-hmm. And, and his opinion, you know, has been for some time when the, the Wuhan thing started is that you're better off overreacting to this right. and just, just make sure that you're not wrong on the bet that you make. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because the downside of being wrong if you underreact is not just to you, it's to the people around you. When we look at this uh, psychology of fear here, one of the things that I'm looking at, and I was just reading some work by the psychologist Elliot Cohn, who who deals in this area a lot, the concept that it's not just fear of the coronavirus, 
but it's the fear of losing control, of being out of control. And I think that that's very closely tied to the fear of the unknown. If I don't know what's going on, I feel like I'm not in control. Now, for me, I, I am not a control freak. I like change, and so I don't think I fall victim to that as much as other people might. But there are others who have those perfectionist tendencies. They want to say that they are in control, and they're just feeling like they're not in control right now. Are you sensing that, that part of the freak out level might be based on whether or not you have that sense that you're in control or you're out of control? Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm very much subject to that personally. So my anxiety is not having control. So you and I are wired very different in this regard. Mm -hmm. What I said earlier that makes me feel better is putting an action plan together and then feeling like I have some control over at least what I'm doing. Sure. Is there something that I'm doing right now that would prevent me from getting the coronavirus? No. I mean, if I, if I run into somebody who has it, how would you know where you got it or how you got it? Um, but the, the fact that I still get to control what I do in my response makes me feel better. Mm -hmm. And for some people it does. And for other people, it's very difficult for them to get past that. I think a lot of people, the uncertainty is, is debilitating. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what fear does to people. When you don't know, am I going to get it? When will I get it? Will I infect other people? And you're getting this constant media drip of coronavirus 24 right. hours a day. So you're constantly having your attention pulled back to it. But if I go back to where you started this conversation, where we look and we say, well, what is fear in the first place? And, you know, the brain's job is to keep us alive. And so we have this threat sensitivity that we carry with us on a regular basis. And then we add to it, you know, our trauma, uh, our experiences, our, our perceptions, whether they're real or they're fabric fabricated. Uh, and not to mention the conditioning that you're just talking about right there with uh, the uh, the media. And after a while, it seems completely overwhelming. But I've kind of look at this and say in that response to fear or the reaction to fear, you can really let that auto response. Right. If we go to Kahneman's thinking fast and slow, we can just let our fast brain take that. And I, to me, that's kind of a low road approach. It, it, for you, you may admit right now, and I appreciate the honesty, that you struggle with being out of control and the anxiety that comes along with it, but you're taking a high road approach, which is, okay, well, what is the measure of response? What can I control? Can I do that much? And this is my concern, and again, my beef with the media is that they're absolutely feasting on the low road response, the auto response working very much the primitive side of the brain without necessarily looking into the high road, the measure response. In my opinion, there are people who the incentive for them is to prey on your fears mm -hmm. and to make sure that you stay connected to the television or the website and that you're, you're paying attention and you're giving them what they need for their, their economic model. And I definitely think that that's the low road. I, I do think though that there's a lot of things, you know, right now I'm seeing things on social media, like fear is false evidence appearing real. It's a nice thought, yeah. <laughs> but there, there, there's danger. There's, a, right. there's real danger and yeah. the fear response to real danger is how you stay alive. Mm -hmm. So when there's real danger, you look at it and you go, that's a real danger. I should make sure that I do everything I can so that I, I don't have to have the negative consequence of the real danger that people are facing right now, you yeah. know, and, and I think the, the response for some people has been underwhelming to me when, mm -hmm. even though they don't believe that they're going to get sick, catching this and then giving it to other people who are vulnerable is nothing that anybody wants to do. So the sure. danger is real. Mm -hmm. And I do think that you have to go to, to your slow thinking brain to decide how you're going to respond to this. And mm -hmm. Kahneman's work is um, brilliant. And if uh, you haven't looked at it, if you're listening to this, um, get it, get it on an audio book or just go Google, uh, Daniel Kahneman and, and watch a YouTube or two videos and mm -hmm. start to understand that the response of your fast brain, that, that is to keep you alive. And it makes very, very quick and rash judgments, not always the best thinking the slow brain, you, you need both of them, but the slow brain sometimes does better on thinking of these things longer term. Let's uh, think about this, uh, in outside of the context of coronavirus here for just a moment and think about where we see fear uh, on from from time to time, either the fear that we carry around as part of our personality. But right now we're talking more about circumstantial fear. And when I think about the things that are being said today, you know, this is horrible and it's going to get worse before it gets better. And I'm not debating all of those things, but I am recognizing that if you set the clock back 10 years uh, at the 
to, to go back to 2010, people were saying exactly the same thing. And it wasn't any less true or more true then than it is right now. And yet there was that response to fear that was really interesting because I look back at, at 2010 and I think, you know, if you gave into fear completely at that time and shut down your life, did you really benefit from it? When you think about, you know, who lost the, uh, the most money uh, in the economy in the, the Great Recession, as we would call it, it's the people who sold on the downside. Uh, but if you if you think about the S and P, right, it closed yesterday at uh, what twenty three hundred or something like that in two thousand and ten. It was at at thirteen hundred. If you'd have bought it two thousand and ten, you'd been okay. Think about the average housing price in two thousand and ten at two fifty. Uh, in January of 2020 in the United States, that was 405. So there are opportunities here. Is it right to be thinking opportunistically, or do you look and you go, "Wow, you're getting into a moral shaky ground there, Jeff"? I think you're right for a couple reasons. I, I think that we tend to fear the wrong danger, mm-hmm. and so we 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 because of our fast thinking brain, we we fear the wrong danger. I wrote a whole chapter on that in the Law Start of Closing, and the publisher hated it. And, and we, we don't want to call the client to follow up because we're afraid they're going to be unhappy with us. Mm -hmm. And the real risk is not making them unhappy. The real risk is letting the opportunity die because you didn't follow up. Uh, I think you probably have strong feelings about something like this right now, specifically Mm -hmm. uh, with a book coming out. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. So we, we tend to look at this and say, well, what is my fear? And if the fear causes you to hunker down, then you do miss opportunities. And I think that anybody that went through that time that's listening to this, it was a, it was a great time. And I think there's a personal responsibility here that I feel. And, and there's one that I hope that business people feel Mike Weinberg wrote about it uh, yesterday about salespeople's responsibility, but as a business person, we have to rebuild this. I mean, we, we, we can't, just hunker down and, and wait for the, the storm to subside. There's always a storm. Mm-hmm. So our job is to go back and rebuild civilization. And when this chaos is over, we'll face another chaos and we're going to have to carve order out of chaos. Like we always do. Mm-hmm. And, and that, that's the thing that you can't let fear debilitate you or paralyze you because we have to make sure that this thing comes back stronger than it was before. Mm-hmm. And I believe we will not, not in the next couple of weeks, but but in the next six months, I think we will. Mm-hmm. I know we will. Yeah. yeah. This is a great thing about human beings. We have enormous creativity, uh, enormous resourcefulness, the ability to figure these things out. The, all of human history is basically summed up in uh, overcoming the next obstacle mm-hmm. and then maybe creating a more difficult obstacle for yourself afterwards. Right. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. I, I read that blog post by Mike Weinberg that you were talking about, and you know his view was that we have to sell because professional salespeople drive the economy, and the need, the underlying underpinnings of what we're seeing, it didn't go away. It didn't change things. The, this is one of the interesting aspects that I was looking at. I I put out a video on on Saturday on the subject, and it's it's just just really got shared over and over again. But one of the points that I was trying to make was that. Uh, if you're not careful with you think about most purchase decisions that cause deliberation, they're long term decisions. But the coronavirus is a short term circumstance. So do we really want to make long term decisions based on short term environments or short term circumstances? And yet in the short term, the availability bias kicks in so much when I hear it's horrible, it's horrible, it's horrible, it's horrible. It feels long term even though it's not long-term. Now, I'm not suggesting that there aren't going to be economic repercussions or that we might you know, see some, some fallout from this, but the idea that, that uh, the demand for all products or services has gone away is kind of ludicrous when you think about it. So there's that idea that as a salesperson, there is that obligation to try and move forward because people are looking for the calm voice. So let's talk about confidence, because I know you've talked about this and written about this a lot, that the need for confidence almost as not arrogance, but almost as that secret weapon for sales professionals uh, who, if they are not showing confidence, then a lack of confidence gets adopted by their customers, by their prospect, and then the whole thing goes south on us. Talk a little about confidence, what it is, the need for it, how you cultivate it. Some of us are wired this way, and it's um, 
look, I'm, I will self-disclose that uh, I've always been way overconfident. I've always been way out on the edge beyond what I was capable of at the time. Starting when I was a kid and I started playing rock and roll, you know, I was like 16, 17 years old playing in bars, but had not allowed to be in the bar first off, uh, mm -hmm. not allowed to be being paid in beer, which I liked. That was actually a pretty good part, but you, you got to step out on stage in front of a group of people that don't know you. Right. And you're, you're just a kid and you, you do this. So I've always had some of that, but it's, it's, there's a couple variables. I think if you know, what your outcome is and you have the ability to generate that outcome. So you have some competence level confidence is easier. It's when you don't know what's going to happen that people tend to lose their confidence. But if you're, if you're listening to this, the reason that you can have confidence. And I think, um, I listen to CNBC every morning. Mm -hmm. If you're a salesperson and you're listening to this or a leader, you should just listen to CNBC in the morning because you're getting a tremendous education. <clears throat> Everybody who talked about, the fundamentals of the economy over the course of last week and this week so far has said there's no technical fundamental problems. Mm -hmm. There just aren't any. So we yeah. don't have a housing market that is way overblown. We don't have people getting loans that they can't pay. We don't have banks that are undercapitalized with risky derivative mm -hmm. products that they don't understand. Uh, we don't have uh, a government that's you know struggling to to do the things that governments do. There really isn't a big underlying problem except for the pandemic. So where we've lost confidence is this fear that this fear has made us less confident. But all of the fundamentals are still here. And everybody from Goldman Sachs to Citigroup to JP Morgan, to the Federal Reserve has said all the fundamentals are still here. All we have to do is try to keep the system for seizing up while we get ready to rebuild this economy. Mm -hmm. And and we're going to. So there's a good reason to have confidence when all of the experts believe that what's being done is good and right and true mm -hmm. and it's going to work. And we're, we're bending the curve to make sure that we don't lose lives, um, any more lives. And, you know, we, we have to, but we're, we're doing everything right. So you have to have some confidence about this, how you cultivate it in yourself is to believe that you can succeed and you, you have a future orientation that I can go rebuild. I can go back and, and find the clients that I need and make the deals that I need and serve the people that need my help and all those things. So your confidence has to come from this internal belief that you can go make a difference right now. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. my work in the last couple of days and Weinberg's and yours has all been pointing to that. So those of us who can take action and do these things are going to be called to do that. Mm -hmm. And I would tell you, you don't have to wait. You don't, you don't have to wait to start rebuilding this right now. Now right. you might be in your house, Right. You might be on zoom, right. But you don't have to wait to start helping rebuild the economy. And I think yeah. Mark Mike's call to action is exactly right. Mm -hmm. Be confident mm -hmm. and go out and start helping. I will just counter you on one thing. You are self-disclosing that you are overconfident that this might be some imposter syndrome uh, creeping in here. But even if I go back to your early days, you know, playing rock and roll as a long haired kid. And by the way, if you saw a picture of Anthony and you know, you would just, you can't even picture what it's like for Anthony to have long hair. <laughs> but, uh, but if you go back to those days, you know, I, I've always held, you may not agree with this, but I've always held that confidence is the, is the sum of two parts, belief and mastery. If I believe, believe very strongly in what I'm doing and I've mastered the way that I do it, uh, then the end result is confidence. So it's not just, it's not a, a matter of the will. I'm going to be confident. Dang it. It's a matter of, I've, right. I've, I believe very strongly that I add value. I've mastered my craft and the way I do it. So then whether it's sales or music or leadership or what you, you name it, what is it? It's that sum of belief and mastery. So I don't think it's overconfident. I think it's, it's only overconfident when it slips into arrogance, unfounded confidence. Well, I, I can tell you the lack of confidence. I had courage. I'll say that. Like mm -hmm. I, I could step out on stage, but if I could have found a way to hide behind my microphone stand for the first, I don't know, six months playing rock and roll, I would have hid. Like mm -hmm. it was, it was very scary. And everybody on the band was better than me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was the weak link, and, right. but I was the singer. So that's very, very hard to do. I, I think though, if you have to choose the, the fear of failure for many people or the fear of taking the action, uh, is probably the wrong danger. The, mm -hmm. the wrong danger 
is is not doing it especially yeah. right now 100 percent agreement there are, are you seeing anything already in regards to the shifts like when i look at my business most of our the training business of shore consulting is face-to-face -face business um, I instituted a 30-day, which we, we might extend it, but a 30-day travel ban for all of my employees, which means we we had to make an immediate pivot into 100% virtual training, and that is what we're doing. We've got a few different virtual training sessions going on right now. But what about for salespeople? When you see the shift that has to take place, are you seeing anything on a very practical level where salespeople are having to do things differently? Yeah, and I, I think something like Zoom and using video. I mean, we've we've done it for a very long time. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that it's okay now, and this is probably going to make it even more okay. Yeah, because if you, I, I know people who are selling who need to have a meeting, and the client needs to have a meeting, and neither one of them is allowed to travel, and they've now got a video camera on. Mm -hmm. And uh, most people are comfortable. I have seen a couple people where they say my camera's broken and. I have to say, no, you have a pink post-it over your camera. So right. uh, you, you don't want to be on camera. And then they, they go, okay, I'll take the pink yeah. post-it note off. But yeah, it, it's, it's, it's becoming the way that we do business in a mm -hmm. lot of ways because I don't have to travel to you to do it for us mm -hmm. to have a 20-minute conversation. I have right. clients who don't want to talk to me unless we're on video. That video aspect of it, whether it's a Zoom call, whether it's FaceTime, whether it's just communicating to a prospect by way of a video text message, if nothing else, this might spur us to the point of recognizing that you cannot neglect video any longer and think that you're going to have a legitimate say in the way that the sales world works. So if we use all of this to dramatically advance the use of video, I think we're all better off and it's going to be a beautiful thing. Even if it's you and me using video, you think that helps our cause or does, could it harm us? Well, that's, that's a really good point, but there are filters for that. Right. We can we, we can we can have a, there's got to be a filter that gives each of us hair, uh, if nothing else. So, yeah, yeah, I, I want to I want to see your Snapchat filters at some point. <laughs> Fair, that's all you it'll the little be. Bambi eyes yeah, and all that. Sure. No, 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 no. It'll just be hair. It'll just be hair. That'll, that'll be the differentiating picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Hey, listen, before we wrap it up, uh, what are you reading? What are you hearing? What's what is whether it is aside from, you know, the, the, the COVID-19, what is Anthony Iannarino thinking about these days? Well, I just finished reading um, The Splendid in the Vile by Eric Larson, mm -hmm. which is Winston Churchill's first year as uh, prime minister when Germany starts bombing England and then ultimately London and Coventry a perfect book for reading right now because everybody figured out how to keep civilization going through that. And we're going to be called to do that. So it's a particularly great book. And I'm, I'm back to reading fiction, which is rare for me. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I picked up Wolf Hall by Hilary Mantle mm -hmm. and it's a, it's a novel on Thomas uh, Cromwell. And it's so extraordinarily well written that uh, I can't put it down. Uh, before that, I just finished American Dirt uh, by Jeannie Cummins, which is a spectacular book and should be required reading. How about you? Before you hang up, what are you reading? Uh, I, I just recently finished, interestingly enough, I recently finished uh, Bob Spitz's biography of Ronald Reagan. It was it was really interesting because I don't think we really it's such a it was such a weird time that we look back on the Reagan years right now. And the beautiful thing about it is it was really, really balanced. He did not pull any punches. He he praised what was praiseworthy and he attacked uh, what was not. And it was just a very, very interesting. I think that I find it interesting that the world is still trying to figure out where does Ronald Reagan fit in uh, yeah. in the big picture in the long run? What what that legacy, I think, is still being defined. So that was really, really interesting. And then I read uh, the a book called Indianapolis, the true story of the worst sea disaster in U.S. naval history and uh, the cover up that took place uh, uh, and the fight to exonerate the captain of the Indianapolis, who was innocent, but but stood as the scapegoat for the sinking of the Indianapolis. Fantastic book. Really, really interesting read about a story that most people are not even aware of. It was really, really good. I'm, I'm unfamiliar with it. Yep. Sounds good, though. Yep, yep. Very, very good. The only time I think people would be familiar with it is that there's a scene in uh, Jaws where um, Shaw, 
Uh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. His last name is Sean. Anyway, he, he there's a scene where he recounts being in the water, being circled with sharks, <laughs> right. which really did happen. That's the only reason most people are even aware of the, the, the Indianapolis. But it's a fantastic book and a really fascinating story about government cover-up thereafter. Well worth the read. Yep. I was off Catalina in a shark cage, and I was the first one to get in the shark cage, surrounded by sharks, yeah. but in a cage. And about a two and a half, three foot blue shark came through this sort of area that isn't barred in. So you can put your camera out and take pictures. Yeah. And, and the shark was banging into me right. and into the cage. And yeah. uh, I climbed back out of the shark cage and <laughs> they said, why did you get out? And I said, there's a shark in the cage. <laughs> and they said, no, the sharks are on the outside. And I said, no, I assure you that this one's on the inside. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, it's only like two or half, three feet long. And right. they're like, that shark will still bite you. Yeah, sure it will. And I'm like, yeah. well, then you, you go get it out. Yeah, I'll exactly. I think I'm done right now. Anthony Iannarino, the sales blog is what you want to follow. The sales blog, it is uh, arguably the the, the most uh, well-read uh, blog in the sales business. His books were amazing. Uh, he's got all kinds of uh, virtual programs that you can follow as well. Uh, definitely worth following. And again, just really, really good to sit down and chat with a friend. Anthony, thanks for being back. And thanks for the really wise words for people who really need a calm head right now. Appreciate it. Uh, thanks for having me on. Let's do this again. And um, you'll come on my podcast. Sounds good. Thanks, buddy. All right, there you have it. Just really, really wise words. And I just want to encourage uh, all of you, you know, by the time some of you listen to this, this pandemic will be long gone. It'll be a distant memory. But that doesn't mean that your buyer doesn't have fear. They do. And so you have that opportunity to bring positive energy, to bring calm, and to bring information so that by the time you're done, your customer will adopt your level of confidence. And that's when we're really doing them a huge favor. They can look at you for their cue. It's like when I'm flying, if there's a lot of turbulence, I look at the flight attendant. If the flight attendant is calm, then I am calm. That's the way it is for you and your customers. It doesn't matter what the environment is. Your customer is looking to you for that confidence. Let's give them what they really need. Then you'll have the opportunity to change their world. Thank you.